Hey, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Joshua here at SaltyScales.com. So, hey, as of July 1st, you may have heard there is a new program that you must take or an educational learning program that the FWC has um, released in order to fish publicly from the beaches and things like that. Now, I don't necessarily think this is a bad thing. I honestly thought this was going to be another permit that you had to do or purchase and I thought it was going to be about money. So I'm really happy that they didn't implement, you know, a cost in this particular program. But what it is in a short gist of things I'm going to show you, I'm also going to actually take this test myself. I'm going to do it right here on video. And again, I don't think it's really a test, guys. It's just a more of an informative thing to help educate people so that way, first off, fish, sharks aren't getting hurt, people aren't getting hurt, and we're taking care of the environment, which in my opinion are all great things. So some of the changes that are going to happen here, as you can see, um, they're going to be a mandatory no-cost annual shore-based fishing permit that you must uh, obtain. Um, anyone 16 or over must have this permit. And as long as someone you're fishing with has the permit, then you're not technically, uh, you don't technically have to have it. So that is a good thing as well. But I think everyone should take it, honestly. Uh, and that includes people that are over 65. Uh, so you're not omitted from this particular permit, especially if you're fishing, which I don't know a whole lot of people over 65 that are shark fishing. But if you are, you got to take the course. Um, so some of the things that they're going to discuss or they, they want you to know is, you, you know, they don't want you chumming from the beaches. Um, they're, they're wanting immediate releases of the shark. So right when you catch it, they don't want you unhooking it for 30 minutes, taking a, mu a million pictures, dragging it out of the water. They want you to pretty much cut the lead or cut the hook and uh, keep the fish in the water. So that way the water's always circulating through its gills. Because as long as that's happening, usually the shark is going to be fine. Not only that, just the weight of the fish itself being on the shore without um, the support of the water also doesn't help its uh, internal organs and things. Uh, and it also is going to require that all the prohibited shark species remain in the water as well. You know, the endangered species, you know, target tiger shark, greater hammerheads, uh, things like that that are protected. Um, so really, I mean, this is all very common sense stuff. Um, it really, uh, I don't think it's going to be challenging. Let's jump in. So where you want to run to or go to is the Learning My FWC is where this is going to be. And if you just Google uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife, uh, shark base program or shark training then you'll see you'll have to create an account and then when you log in here you're gonna see <clears throat> little courses now there's quite a bit uh, there's quite a few different courses actually they even got things on gopher shellfish uh, and things like that but down here under wildlife training and certi certification is where we want to be and that's where the shark fishing is so let's click on that and see what it does here all right so it looks like you got to be enrolled Let's go ahead and enroll me. All right, so there's actually audio. Um, so it's saying if you plan to target, keep sharks from the shore, including structures attached to shore, such as jetties, bridges, and piers, are required to pass this online training. I don't know what the um, penalties are for not having this permit, but I imagine they, you know, they can get you on that aspect. So I don't think it's going to be worth it not to have it. Let's, uh, so it looks like there is four modules, one, two, three, four, with a quiz, and then you get a certificate. Let's go ahead and jump in here. We're going to do this together. Uh, and again, guys, I don't think this is technically a test. This is an educational thing, so I don't think FWC is going to have a problem with us recording this. If they do, I imagine they'll contact me. So it's taking a short minute to load here. Actually taking a long time to load. There must be a lot of people getting their permit, huh? Hey, so while we wait on this, let me know. What, do you, what are your guys' thoughts on this? Do you agree with the new permit? Do you not like it? Uh, tell, me, tell me your thoughts below. Again, I'm a fan of it because, man, I don't believe that we should be killing you know, big prize sharks and, you know, not having the proper knowledge and handling and things just for a picture. I don't really think that's right, guys. I mean, some of these fish are massive, you know, 14, 15 feet, 12 foot. I mean, those are fish that have lived a long time. 
and I think it's important to know how to properly handle them and leave them in the water. You can get some great photos in the water. You don't have to drag them out. Uh, and plus, it's just a lot safer for everybody. So I don't know why this thing is taking so long. All right, here we go. I refreshed it and it popped up. Welcome to Module 1 of FWC's shore-based Shark Smart Fishing Course. Sharks are apex predators that play an important role in marine ecosystems. The primary goals of this course are to educate shore-based shark fishermen on best practices that will increase post-release shark survival, help minimize conflicts between shark anglers and other beachgoers, and increase angler awareness and knowledge of shark identification and related regulations. Agree with all that. All right, and go ahead and click the next. This training is required for all anglers who are targeting or harvesting sharks from shore or any structure attached to shore, such as jetties, bridges, and piers. Anglers 16 and older, including residents over the age of 65 who are normally exempt from needing a license, must apply for and receive the shore-based shark fishing permit after successfully passing this course. Anglers under 16 are exempt from the education requirement if they are fishing with someone who has taken the education course and holds the permit. The shore-based shark fishing permit is also required if you plan to fish from shore and will be fishing with a metal leader more than four feet long, using a fighting belt or harness, or deploying a bait by any other means than casting, kayaking for example, while using a hook that is one and a half inches or larger measured across the widest part of the hook bend. You are not required to have this permit if you are fishing for sharks from a vessel. However, you may still find this training useful regardless of your fishing destination. Okay, I was pretty... Stakeholders such as anglers and beachgoers have reached out to FWC in recent years with a variety of concerns regarding shark fishing from shore. Some have been concerned about human safety when visiting or swimming at a beach where others are shark fishing. Some have been concerned about shark populations and ensuring sharks caught from shore are released in a way that maximizes their chance of survival, while others want to ensure they can continue participating in this historical fishery. This training and permit addresses these concerns by ensuring every angler who is fishing for shark from shore is aware of current regulations and best practices. This includes learning how to increase shark survival whenever you release them, knowledge of current regulations, sharing Florida's beaches and fishery resources with other users, and identifying commonly caught sharks. The permit will also help FWC have a better understanding about how many people are participating in the shore-based shark fishery, as well as giving us a way to contact shore-based shark anglers to share current news and information. So just to touch base on that, guys, Sharks are always at the beach. I don't care if you're shark fishing or not. They're always around beaches, jetties, and piers, period. I've been fishing a long time to know that simple common sense. And I think it's a very small majority that made these complaints. And that's one of my things right now that I have trouble with, even just on social media and things in general. I don't understand how a very minute population can control what the majority do. But that's how it works. I mean, that's how it works with our government, I guess. But really, sharks are always going to be on the beach, regardless if you're shark fishing or not. So in that sense, I don't know. I don't, I don't see where, uh, what they're saying there when people are complaining about shark fishing. Now, do I agree that you should be floating out massive bloody baits when there's like a thousand people right next to you? No, I would like to pre preferably move down the beach where you know there's fewer people stronger currents and things like that where you could fish and fish in a little safe safer manner so let's not take up too much time i just wanted to share a little bit of feedback on that and my opinion in this course you will be required to view four modules total including this intro module the other three modules will focus on shark fishing regulations shark smart fishing best practices and shark anatomy and identification once you have taken all four modules, you will be required to take a 10 question quiz. You must pass this quiz with 100% to receive your certificate of completion. If you do not pass, you can go back through the course modules and retake the quiz until you get a score of 100%. Pretty self explanatory 10 questions. You've got to get 100%. I mean, and I'm pretty sure these are going to be common sense things.
Once you have completed all four modules and have passed the quiz, you will receive a certificate of completion. If you are over 16, please take careful note of the code issued to you on the certificate. You will need this code in order to get your shore-based shark fishing permit on our online licensing website, gooutdoorsflorida.com. You'll be directed to the licensing website once you complete this course. Those under 16 who plan to fish without someone who has both this training and the shore-based shark fishing permit will need to carry the certificate with them when they fish for sharks. Those 16 and older can print their certificate out if they want to, but it will not be required of you as proof that you have completed this course. Your shore-based shark fishing permit will be your proof that you have completed and passed this course. All right, so that is... To get your permit, go to GoOutdoorsFlorida.com, the FWC's recreational licensing website. If you already have an account, sign in. If not, you'll need to create an account. Once you've logged in, click on Purchase a License and scroll to the no-cost, shore-based shark fishing permit and add it to your cart. You will then be prompted to enter your unique identification code from your course certificate of completion. Finally, you will complete your purchase. If you already have a recreational fishing license, the shore-based shark item will be added to it. If you are exempt from needing a license, you will be able to print the permit as is. You can also download the FWC's Fish Hunt Florida app on your smartphone. This app allows you to access your FWC-issued recreational licenses. Let's address some frequently asked questions. Can I get my shore-based shark fishing permit at a bait and tackle store? The only place you can currently get your permit is online at gooutdoorsflorida.com, which means currently you cannot get your permit at a bait and tackle store. What if I already have a fishing license? If you already have a fishing license, you will have the option to print out a copy that includes the permit once you've made your purchase. Or you can also download our licensing app, Fish Hunt Florida, which allows you to pull up any fishing or hunting licenses you may have with the FWC. Is there an expiration date? Yes. The online Shark Smart Fishing Course Certificate and Shore-Based Shark Fishing Permit need to be renewed annually. Let's test your knowledge so far. Choose the correct answer for the following question. If I'm 16 or older, once the Shark Smart Fishing Course is completed, I should A, print my course certificate to carry with me, B, keep my unique identification code and go to gooutdoorsflorida.com to get my permit, or C, do nothing. I think the correct answer is B. If you are 16 or older, you will need to keep your unique identification code and go to gooutdoorsflorida.com to obtain your shore-based shark fishing permit. Okay, so that was the completion of the first module. Uh, like I said, pretty self-explanatory. I imagine uh, that was pretty easy for you too. So let's, uh, let's go back to my courses. All right, so let's move on to module two. Module two is, imagine, very similar to module one. And uh, we'll see what happens here. Again, we're getting a spinning wheel. I notice here I've had to refresh on that first module just to get it to populate. I'm going to go ahead and do that now as we waited for a good minute last time. There it goes. Hit the play button. Let's go. Whether you're fishing for sharks from shore or a vessel, there are some important regulations you need to be aware of before you go. Harvestable sharks are subject to bag, size, and gear limits. There are also 27 species that are prohibited from harvest, and special rules apply when fishing for sharks from shore. This educational module summarizes some of Florida's various shark fishing regulations. Regulations in this module apply when fishing in Florida state waters only. If you plan to fish in federal waters, which is beyond three <coughs> nautical miles on the Atlantic coast and beyond nine nautical miles on the Gulf coast, be sure to check federal regulations. Species such as the Atlantic sharp nose, black nose, black tip, and bonnet head have no minimum size limit. However, several harvestable sharks, including bull, nurse, spinner, and common thresher, all have a 54 inch minimum size limit 
when measured in a straight line from the tip of the snout to where the tail begins to fork. Black tip, bonnet head, spinner, bull, and nurse sharks are all commonly caught from shore. Check myfwc.com for the current size limit for short fin mako. The daily bag limit is one per person per day with a vessel limit of two sharks. That means an angler can only keep a single shark and that the maximum number of sharks that can be retained from a vessel is two, even if more than two anglers are on board. Oh, all right. There are 27 species of shark and four species of ray that are prohibited from harvest, and special regulations apply if you've caught one of those species. Prohibited species that can be caught from shore include great hammerhead, lemon, sandbar, tiger, and even the occasional great white. Whether fishing from shore or from a boat, prohibited species must remain in the water with the gills submerged. Do not bring prohibited species onto a fishing vessel, a pier, or bridge, or onto land, or in shallow enough water that the shark is not continuously submerged, including its gills. When fishing from shore, prohibited species must be released without delay. This means things like taking photos or measuring the shark cannot be done if they will delay release. If you don't know what shark species you've caught, treat it as a prohibited species and release without delay. Often, the fastest way to release a shark is to use bolt or cable cutters to cut the hook or leader as close to the hook as you can. If you can remove the hook without delaying release, do so. And honestly, ladies and gentlemen, let's be serious. There's not a whole lot of reason to keep a shark that large. I mean, the mercury levels, they taste like crap. I mean, the only shark that I typically keep um, is black tips. And if you bleed them and you clean them properly and you soak them in milk or lemon, uh, they're actually really delicious. So, but we don't need to be keeping these and killing these mon uh, monster fish. When fishing from shore or vessel, sharks can only be targeted using hook and line. Non-offset, non-stainless steel circle hooks must be used when shark fishing with live or dead natural bait. Using treble hooks or any other hook with more than one point with live or dead natural bait is prohibited. Consider filing down or removing hook barbs, which can make hook removal easier and faster. You must also be in possession of a device capable of quickly cutting the hook or leader, such as a bolt cutter or cable cutters. If you have experience with the hooking devices, one may be good to have on hand as it can assist with quickly and safely to hooking a shark. So what they're saying is you need a universal key at all times when shark fishing. Okay, well, I agree with that, guys. Um, obviously, the reason for a non-stainless hook is because if you do cut the leader, which I don't necessarily agree with, they want it to rust out very quickly. So using something other than stainless will allow that to happen. But this baby right here can cut and it'll cut quick. It's the universal key. Have it with you when you shark fishing and uh, who knows, maybe it'll save a fish's life. When fishing from the beach, the practice of chumming is prohibited, whether fishing for sharks or any other species. That means you can't chum for shark from the beach and you also can't chum for sheep's head, for example. Chum is defined as animal products, real or synthetic, placed into the water for the purpose of attracting, but not actively harvesting, a marine organism. Bait attached to a hook is explicitly excluded from this definition. Beach is defined as any saltwater shoreline covered in enough sand above the mean high tide line to support sunbathing. To learn more about FWC regulations, including special requirements if you plan to fish for sharks in federal waters, visit myfwc.com slash marine and click on recreational regulations and sharks. True or false, if I catch a prohibited species from shore, I should release the fish as quickly as possible using something like bolt or cable cutters to cut the hook or leader or by removing the hook if it does not delay release. Come on, what's the answer now? True. Answer, true. If removing the hook will delay release, cut the hook or leader as close to the hook as possible with bolt or cable cutters. Bingo. All right, so that was module two. Module two is a little shorter, a little quicker, more uh, to the point. So 
Let's uh, see if we can go to module three here. All right, module three, shark smart fishing. Here we go. Shark smart fishing is a series of best practices that can be helpful to anglers who plan to fish for sharks. These tips help ensure that when you've caught a shark that you plan to release, or that must be released due to current regulations, that shark will have the best chances of survival. These tips will also include guidance such as planning ahead, choosing a good location, staying safe, and leaving your fishing area clean when done. I agree with all those things, guys. We gotta pick up after ourselves too. We got beautiful beaches in Florida. It's where a lot of our uh, tourism, or what attracts a lot of our tourism, and people don't wanna see trash, dead fish, stinking uh, dead bait uh, on the, the shorelines. So, got to do our part. Florida's beaches are a popular destination for residents and visitors alike. Opportunities for recreation include, but are not limited to, swimming, sunbathing, surfing, fishing, kayaking, snorkeling, and so much more. It is important that all user groups share Florida's beautiful coastline in a safe and respectful manner. Many non-fishing beachgoers have concerns about safety. As an angler, there are things you can do voluntarily to contribute to everyone's enjoyment of Florida's beaches. Anglers should avoid shark fishing near swimmers or popular swimming areas. To avoid this, many shore-based shark anglers choose to fish during times of year when there are less people at the beach or times of day when people aren't swimming. If you are fishing in a popular swimming or sunbathing area, consider moving to another area if swimmers arrive. If shark fishing at night, Use only amber or red lighting during sea turtle nesting season, which is March through October each year. Also keep in mind that many beaches have houses nearby. Loud noises and bright lights might be disrupting to the beach's residents, human or not. Florida's natural resources belong to all people, so treat others you encounter on the beach with respect. When done fishing, be sure to pick up and securely stow or dispose of any trash or gear you brought with you, including monofilament fishing line, which can be recycled at monofilament recycling bins across the state. If your shark does not survive release and washes ashore, contact the FWC's Fish Call Hotline at 1-800-636-0511 to have the event recorded in their database. Samples will be collected if staff or agency partners are available. So this is why it's important, guys, to make sure these fish are going to be uh, revived and released properly. Because you can see here immediately what jumps out to me is FWC is going to be tracking the, uh, the deaths, the death toll. And if the death toll is high, you better believe there will be shark uh, fishing restrictions in the near future. So I promise you, we start seeing a bunch of dead sharks that are being reported on this hotline, you will see restrictions in the near future and possibly the elimination of shore-based shark fishing. After choosing a location, the next best thing you can do is to come to that location prepared for anything. Have a good knowledge of what sharks you might catch, how to identify them, and what the regulations are for those species. If you catch a shark and are unsure what species it is, treat it as though it is prohibited and released without delay. Have release tools with you and ready, including a tool such as a bolt or a cable cutter that are capable of cutting the hook or leader as close to the hook as possible. You may also use a dehooking tool to remove the hook from the shark's mouth if you are experienced enough to do so without delaying release of the shark. If you plan to take photos or video, make sure the camera is ready beforehand and that someone other than the person actively releasing the shark is available to take them. Make sure everyone on your trip knows their role in the release procedure process. And finally, have the appropriate tackle for the species of shark being targeted. So the know before you go, uh, obviously we can't always know exactly what species of shark is going to consume our bait, but there is a good way to try to figure out what species is going to hit our bait. If you're using whole stingrays, it's usually going to be a big lemon, bull shark, and, or a hammerhead. Usually those three almost always. If I'm using a whole mackerel, it's always usually going to be a spinner shark or a black tip and maybe the occasional bull shark. And that applies for ladyfish too. So obviously smaller baits uh, in that sense will a lot of times uh, 
draw in a certain species, like bonnet heads, for example. I use a shrimp or a small greenback, and I'll catch bonnet heads. You're never going to see a bonnet head eat a whole uh, stingray. So that, that's kind of common sense, and that's what she's referring to when she says know before you go and know kind of what kind of species you're going to be targeting. Proper tackle is the first step in catch and release fishing. Use non-stainless steel, non-offset circle hooks, which is required when fishing for sharks with live or dead natural bait from shore or a boat. These hooks are known to be easier to remove, are more likely to rust away, and are more likely to hook the shark in the corner of the mouth, which aids in dehooking. Flattening or filing down hook barbs can also make hook removal easier and faster. Make sure you're using a hook size that is appropriate for the shark targeted. Use heavy tackle and a minimum of 80 pound test. So they want you to file down the barbs, which is a great tip. Uh, filing down the barb will allow you to really pop that hook out quickly. And using heavier gear, 80 pound test or, or, or higher, they want that heavier gear because they don't want the fish to fight till, till death. And if you're using smaller uh, gear, then uh, oftentimes those fights can last a lot longer than they should. They want you to get them to the beach, get your picture, get it released. Sharks are powerful and potentially dangerous fish, but you can maximize the safety of both the angler and the shark by handling and releasing using the following shark smart best practices. Minimize fight time by using appropriate tackle. Do not target sharks if the surf is too rough to release the sharks quickly, appropriately, and safely. Keep sharks, especially the gills, in the water if you don't intend to harvest them. Removing the shark from the water can increase the likelihood of injuries to the shark, anglers, and bystanders. FWC regulations require that not only the gills, but the entire length of the shark must remain in the water if it is a prohibited species. Prohibited or not, never bring a large shark, over five feet for example, onto a fishing vessel, pier, or bridge, or onto dry land beyond the surf zone unless you plan to harvest it. Minimize handling and release time and do not delay release just to take pictures. Do not sit on the shark's back for a photo. Use tools such as bolt cutters to cut the hook or cable cutters to cut the leader as close to the hook as possible. Sharks that swim off with a long length of line trailing behind them may be less likely to survive. If you have experience with using a long handled dehooking device, you may consider this as an option to remove the hook as long as this process does not delay release. There are 27 species of shark that are prohibited from harvest. Know which shark species are prohibited and how to identify them before you go. Prohibited species of shark must be released without delay and must be left in the water during release with the entire length of the shark in the water and their gills submerged at all times. If you have to lift the head of a prohibited shark out of the water to cut the hook or leader or to remove the hook, do it quickly and return the head to the water without delay. Do not bring a prohibited species onto a fishing vessel, a pier, or a bridge or onto land or in shallow enough water that the shark is not continuously submerged, including its gills. Use a cutting tool, such as bolt or cable cutters, to cut the hook or the leader as close to the hook as you can. If you can remove the hook without delaying release, do so. Treat unidentified sharks as a prohibited species and release them. If you don't know, let it go. So it really just boils down, they want you to protect the protected species. I mean, guys, there's a reason they're protected. Um, the harvest of sharks uh, over the last few decades has been a detrimental to their population, especially for finning and things, which is, if you've ever watched a documentary on that, it's extremely brutal and just, uh, oh man, I can't even believe, I, I, when I watched that documentary, I couldn't believe people did that. It's amazing to me that someone would waste a, a beautiful and a, a massive fish over their fence and, and literally cut them off and throw them back in the water while they're alive so they can slowly drown. It's crazy to me. When targeting sharks from shore, occasionally you may hook onto something you didn't intend to catch. Sawfish and manta ray 
are federally listed under the Endangered Species Act and cannot be targeted, but are occasionally caught. If you catch a sawfish or a manta ray, you should cut the hook or leader as close to the hook as possible and release without delay. Do not try to remove the hook as this can be dangerous and causes added stress to the fish. If you catch a sawfish, please report your catch to FWC at sawfish at myfwc.com or 1-844-4-SAWFISH. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Since the protection of the sawfish, you have been seeing them more and more, uh, especially down like in the Keys and things like that. So it's pretty neat to see that the protection is working. Question. True or false? Non-stainless steel, non-offset circle hooks are a good tool to use when fishing for sharks, but are not required. So the question is, non-stainless steel, non-offset circle hooks are a good tool to use when fishing for sharks, but are not required. It's false. The correct answer is false. You must use a non-stainless steel, non-offset circle hook when using live or dead natural bait when fishing for or harvesting sharks, whether you are fishing from shore or a boat. All right, so that's uh, that module. Now we have one other, the mo uh, module four, shark ID, which it's your responsibility to learn what sharks you're targeting or what uh, fish you're targeting. This looks like it's going to be probably the longest of all the modules. And uh, let's jump in and we'll wrap this baby up. That or we have a lot of shark fishing, fishermen trying to take these uh, little quizzes. Highly doubt it though. It's Florida is home to a variety of shark of species, many of which are subject to size and bag limits or are prohibited from harvest altogether. Knowing how to correctly identify the shark you've caught will help <coughs> ensure you are adhering to Florida regulations. The first rule of shark identification is if you do not know or are unsure of what species you've caught, treat it as though it was a prohibited species. There are several species that are prohibited from harvest that can be commonly caught from shore, and among those species, there are a few that are commonly mistaken for non-prohibited species. For example, lemon sharks, which are prohibited from harvest, are occasionally mistaken as bull sharks. Knowing the basics of shark anatomy is step one in correctly identifying a shark. By familiarizing yourself with key features, it will be easier to distinguish one shark species from another. The next few slides will go into greater detail on the three main features that are useful to know in shark identification, fin placement, tail shape, and the inner dorsal ridge. Several species can be identified by fin placement. Shark identification based on fin looks at where the first dorsal fin, or the big fin on top of the shark, starts compared to where the pectoral fins, the pair of fins under the shark near the gill slits, are located. There are three common types of fin placement. For some sharks, the first dorsal fin starts in front of the pectoral fin insertion, or the point where the rear part of the pectoral fin connects to the body. For others, the first dorsal fin starts over the pectoral fin inner margin, which is the area behind the pectoral fin insertion that is not connected to the body, but faces along the body. And a final group of sharks have a first dorsal fin that starts entirely behind the pectoral fin with all parts of the pectoral fin in front of the dorsal fin. An example of three commonly confused sharks that can be identified by fin placement include sandbar, bull, and lemon shark. All three species can be caught from shore, and two of these species, sandbar and lemon, are prohibited from harvest. A sandbar shark's first dorsal fin starts in front of the pectoral fin insertion. A bull shark's first dorsal fin starts over the pectoral fin inner margin and a lemon shark's first dorsal fin starts behind the pectoral fin. Looking at the shape of a shark's tail can also help you identify what species you've caught. There are three common tail shapes in sharks. 
the normal typical tail shape has an upper lobe that is longer than the lower lobe. This type of tail shape is seen in common species such as bull, spinner, blacktip, and tiger sharks. The lunate tail shape has an upper and lower lobe that are nearly equal in length, creating a half moon shape. This tail type is only seen in a few species of shark found in Florida, including the short fin mako, long fin mako, and white sharks. The elongate tail shape has an upper lobe that is extremely long when compared to the lower lobe. The upper lobe of the tail is often as long as the rest of the shark's body. This tail type is only seen among the thresher sharks in Florida, including the common thresher and big eye thresher. Another important physical characteristic that might help you identify whether a shark can be harvested or not is the inner dorsal ridge. This ridge is a visible line of raised skin between the dorsal fins. Sharks with this key characteristic are called ridgeback sharks. Almost all sharks with an inner dorsal ridge are prohibited from harvest. The only exceptions are the oceanic white tip shark and smooth dogfish. There are several species of shark that are commonly misidentified. We've already talked some about bull sharks and lemon sharks and how fin placement can help you tell the difference between the two, but you can also help differentiate these species in other ways. For example, the two dorsal fins on a lemon shark are nearly the same size, whereas the second dorsal fin on the bull shark is much smaller than the first dorsal fin. The lemon shark also has a different yellow, greenish to olive gray color, whereas the bull shark is typically a pale to dark gray color. And finally, small bull sharks often have black tipped fins. It's important to know the difference in these two species because while bull sharks can be harvested, lemon sharks are prohibited from harvest. So what I always notice is when I'm fishing, like bull sharks seem to always have a broader body. But how I always distinguish my lemon sharks, it seems, is that first dorsal fin, it sits way further back next to that pectoral fin than, say, a bull shark. And, of course, that second dorsal is always a lot taller. So they're, once you see them a couple of times, they're pretty easy to distinguish. Blacktip and spinner sharks are another two commonly misidentified sharks. And while neither are prohibited from harvest, spinner sharks have a 54 inch minimum size limit, whereas blacktips have no size limit. The easiest way to quickly tell the difference between these two species is to look at the anal fin. If it has a black tip, it is a spinner shark. If it does not, it is a blacktip shark. Actually, all of the spinner shark's fins will have black tips, which may be counterintuitive based on their names. Fin placement is different on these two species as well, with the spinner shark's first dorsal fin beginning behind the pectoral fins, and the black tip's first dorsal fin beginning over the pectoral fin's inner margin. So you really have to be careful with this one, guys. I don't know why they didn't just call the spinner shark the black tip and vice versa, but because technically they both spin when they jump, or when you catch them a lot of times, the black tips will spin, the spinner sharks will spin. I've had both of them do it, so just be careful with that one. Of course, hammerhead sharks have a very specific and identifiable head shape that makes them stand out from other shark species. Great, smooth, and scalloped hammerhead sharks are prohibited from harvest in Florida. Bonnethead sharks have a similar head shape but their head is more shovel-like, and they're much <coughs> smaller in size than your typically caught hammerhead with a max size of about four feet. Bonnet heads can be harvested under the overall shark bag limit of one per person, but no more than two per vessel per day. Yeah, bonnet he heads are always, uh, you're never usually gonna see them over three and a half foot long. It's rare anyway, but that shovel nose always gives it away. And, you know, the hammerhead has a pretty much a straight bill right across um, but you can easily distinguish them but I hear it all the time oh that's a baby hammerhead no, it's a bonnet head on this page there are several links to handy guides available to help you with your shark identification including documents from the FWC's fishing lines field guide know your Florida sharks 
the FWC Highly Migratory Species Shark ID Guide, the Florida Museum of Natural History, and FWC's Species Profile pages. Question, if I don't know what species I've caught, I should A, pull the shark to shore and grab my identification guide, B, treat it as a prohibited species and release immediately, or C, take photos of my catch so I can identify it later? That answer would be B. The correct answer is B. While it is a good idea to have a field guide on hand, and you can definitely ask a friend to take photos while you are in the act of release, if you do not know what kind of shark you have caught, you should always treat that species as prohibited and release without delay. Thank you for completing all four modules of the Shark Smart Fishing course. Okay, so now we gotta take a quiz. Let's take our quiz. If a shark has an inner dorsal ridge, it's most likely okay to harvest. That would be false. Cutters capable of cutting the hook or leader, such as bolt or cable cutters, are required gear when fishing for sharks. That would be true. Is it okay to target a federally listed species, such as a sawfish or manta ray, as long as you release it immediately? That would be false. Chumming is prohibited when fishing from a beach, regardless of species, fishing from a pier, if you plan to harvest sharks, fishing for sharks. So that would be A. If I catch a prohibited species, I must pull the shark into the shallows, always remove the hook before releasing, keep the shark in the water at all times, and release without delay. Let's go to the next page. Selecting a good shoreline fishing location is important because beach with uh, rough surf or otherwise poor conditions can make it difficult to release sharks quickly and safely. It can reduce conflicts with people. It can help ensure sharks shark fishing remains compatible with shark conservation and public safety. That would be all the above. I'm not required to take this educational course if I am 65 years or older or, or under 16 years old. I'm fishing from a vessel. I'm fishing from a shark from a pier. I'm paddling out of bait because I'm fishing from a vessel. If you're unsure of the species you've caught, you should treat it as a prohibited species and release immediately. That is true. When should this educational course be taken again? If I use, if I'm issued a citation for shark fishing, if you only have to take this course once, the answer is annually. Proper tackle is the first step in catch and release fishing. With that in mind, what gear should I target sharks with? A stainless steel circle hook with a minimum of 30 pound test? That would be no. Non stainless steel circle hooks with a minimum of 80 pound? That's the correct answer. It's B. Let's go ahead and finish attempt. All right. Submit all to finish. Once you submit, you no longer be able to change your answers for this attempt. Okay. Let's see. We got 100 or 10 out of 10, 100%. Took two minutes and eight seconds to finish. And most of that time was because I was actually reading off the questions and answers for you guys. But that is the completion of our short base shark fishing permit. So now, obviously, we got to go to GoOutdoors.com to get my little certificate, and I'm all set. Hey, guys, if you enjoyed this video, please give a thumbs up, comment below, and subscribe. And, hey, until next time, maybe I'll see you on the beach shark fishing.